We appreciate very much Joshua leading the song this morning, and I do need a volunteer song leader for the next service too, so if you're a song leader, why well, see me after this service is concluded. Ernie, we're grateful for your prayer, very thoughtful, very well worded. We're uh, privileged this morning to uh, have a wonderful friend and a great gospel preacher with us, Brother Robert Moss. Robert moved here from uh, the state of Missouri about 10 or 11 years ago, I believe it was, and has been the pulpit preacher for the Highland Congregation over in South Fort Worth since that time. About five or six years ago, he lost his wife to cancer, and we uh, rallied around him as best we knew how to sympathize and encourage. But fortunately, through God's providence, uh, a lovely lady in the congregation there who had lost her husband, he and uh, she and uh, Robert uh, have married since then, and we're thankful for that. He has uh, uh, preached the gospel for a long, long time. In fact, he's preached for 35 years. He's a native of the state of Tennessee, and he has uh, received his schooling from Freed Hardeman University, from Tennessee Bible College, and from the Preston Road School of Preaching when it was still uh, active. Along with his pulpit work, his labors have included mission work, both in the United States and abroad, uh, he's uh, done live and recorded television and radio broadcast. He's spoken on any number of lectureships and held gospel meetings and written uh, uh, articles. He has two married daughters and two grandchildren, and we're happy to have him here to speak on two who were dear to the Apostle Paul. You know, when we think of such uh, illustrious individuals as Peter and James and John, we're all familiar with those and with Paul. But we're not always that familiar with some of the uh, other Christians who lived back in New Testament times, but they were known to the apostles. And the Apostle Paul uh, certainly makes mention of them, and he's going to talk about that this morning. And Robert, we're so glad to have you. Thank you, Brother Maxey. I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, Brother Maxey, to uh, the other elders at the congregation here at Brown Trail, and those who are involved in the lectureship, I'm very thankful for the invitation to be able to be here today and to uh, especially be able to participate in this effort. I consider it an honor, and for those who were involved, I thank you very much. It is such a privilege to be able to not only just attend, but to be able to hopefully uh, be a servant for the Lord in offering some, some good to this effort that is going on. Very grateful for that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on things of that nature. I, I am thankful, but there's a little box up here staring at me that most of you know about. The time is running down, so I'm going to uh, move on and get into our subject matter. We find our lesson this morning in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19 and going down through verse 30. If you'd like to look, we are going to read at this time from there. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. <clears throat> but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the good of him that as a son with a father... He hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Because of the work of Christ, for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, 
to supply your lack of service toward me. Marvelous reading there. Um, there are a number of directions that we could go with this uh, wonderful set of passages from God's Word. But the purpose that was assigned to me and that I understood when the um, uh, layout was mailed to me, that what we want to do is look at these two men and their circumstances sort of as a springboard to introduce the subject as it relates to the church today and how we need to be concerned about the opportunity and the privilege that we have of being fellow laborers in the kingdom of God. Paul looks at Timothy and Epaphroditus and he gives special attention to them. And there are numbers of reasons for that. Concerning Timothy, Paul there in verse 21 says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Now when you look at that word naturally, you go back to the original language there, the word carries the idea of sincere or genuine. Now, someone who is sincere, who is genuine, is someone that is needed in the Lord's church. We need people that are sincere and genuine. Now, obviously, we have to be uh, living in compliance with the Word of God. That is our standard that we are to follow. There are a lot of people, and we say it sadly, there are a lot of people in the world that are sincere in some spiritual matters, religious matters, but aren't in compliance with what the Word of God says. So obviously we must be in compliance with His will. But one who may be seeking to follow that will, who is not sincere, is not genuine, then you have problems there as well. But Paul looks here at Timothy and he sees a marvelous man. You know, when you think about sincerity and uh, someone being genuine, uh, isn't it best when our duty becomes natural? That is something that, that has become natural for us. So often we are able to look at those who are older than us in the faith and have been serving the Lord for many years and, and you look and you see, it, it just seems like they, they go along so smoothly in their good efforts for the Lord. Well, it comes natural to them. Why? Because they have been working on that for so long. It doesn't mean that they don't have struggles and trials, they do. But it's something that is natural to them, and it should become that way to us. Paul felt a special companionship between himself and Timothy on this occasion, and of course others. Uh, Timothy had shown himself worthy. And what a commendable idea. He had shown himself worthy. Others had not necessarily reached this level in the mind of Paul in relation to this particular event. Now that doesn't mean that these other brethren were horrible individuals, but they were not in the circumstance that Timothy was in on this because uh, when you read earlier in scriptures, the Bible helps us to understand that Paul and Timothy were together there when the church had been established. And so he had a, a, a what you might say, a natural contact there, which would help him to have concern for these brethren in a way that maybe those who were not there in that beginning uh, might not have. Now, there are obviously some, as he mentions in the passage there, who uh, are not following as steadfastly in their sincerity as they should. And of course, we need to be mindful of that in our own lives that such would not happen. In verse 22, Paul notes, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he had served with me in the gospel. He had been tested. This word proof in the original carries the idea of testing, as in those days when they would test metals such as gold and silver to see if they were legitimate currency. There was a testing, there was a proving of that. And Timothy had been tested, he had been proved. And he was fit for the occasion. There was a deep sense of camaraderie there. For a man to use the uh, analogy of a father and son. Well, they, they were a father and son in the faith. Well, what a marvelous relationship. 
What a marvelous compliment for Timothy, for Paul to say, I, I'm like a father and he is like a son to me. When you began looking at those words, you see then that there is a very close relationship there that is involved between the working of these two men in the Lord's service together. Now we could look at other passages in the New Testament uh, concerning Paul and concerning Timothy and various works, but I want to lay that as a little bit of groundwork concerning him. And then we move on to Epaphroditus. And Paul mentions that he is sending Epaphroditus to the Philippian brethren as well. In verse 25 he notes, Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. Now, there are five appositions that are used here. And sometimes when you read in Scripture how someone's name is placed, and then there are those factors or those characteristics that are related to that individual that are listing, we might say, that would be wonderful to be said of me. And we would desire that someone would, would say that of us. And often in Scripture, maybe it's just a few words. Enoch walked with God. What a marvelous... You know, when you begin considering the wording and what it means and what it tells us of these individuals, consider here, he says, uh, my brother, he's a fellow member of the body of Christ. That makes it a very special relationship. We'll touch on that a little bit later on. But he says also he is a companion in labor. Here's one who stands side by side. He is a companion of this one, and they have a camaraderie there in the Lord's service. What greater opportunity. But then he goes on. Thirdly, he says he is a fellow soldier. He stood in battle with Paul and other Christians as they stood against Satan and the forces that sought to bring the church down. What a marvelous thought that this man would line himself with the Apostle Paul and with other faithful Christians as a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, he says he is a messenger. He was a help to Paul during a very trying time in his life. And most of us have trying times that come along or will, and maybe we've had some and we'll have more. And what a marvelous opportunity to have brethren in Christ, a brother or sister in Christ, to be there and to be what we need at the time. But also, he says, he is a minister. He sought to join in with the work of the Apostle Paul in doing the work of Jesus Christ, a minister. He had the greatest message in all the world to spread to people. And he was not ashamed to stand there, even in the challenging and the dangerous situations into which they often face, he was willing to stand ready to set forth the message of Jesus Christ. Quite often, we look at ourselves and the circumstances that we deal with, in some regards from a physical nature, pale in comparison to what the challenges that they faced. They faced imprisonment, they faced being beaten, even death. But when we look around us in the world today, that may be the future of some members of the church around the world. Who knows, maybe even our own country. It's no wonder that Paul took the opportunity here to give attention to these two faithful brethren. And as he looks at them and as he recognizes that bond of fellowship that they have, he proudly looks to the brethren there and says, these are the men that I'm going to send to help you. They're men that can help you. These men had prepared themselves to help. They had prepared themselves to be in the position into which they could take up the opportunity at this time and stand in the gap where it's needed. We probably have some Brown Trail students here today, do we? Some of you Brown Trail students? Yes, they're sitting over in this area need to be preparing yourself. We need the Timothys. We need more Epaphroditus today. You're going to have to prepare yourself. You have good opportunities here to prepare yourself so that you can stand in those gaps and you can help the brethren. And may we all pray that God will use us to do the same thing. Now that's a little foundation 
and if I understood what was given me correctly, I wanted to lay that foundation and then consider this bond of fellowship and how it relates to us. Because, you know, as we look at the Bible, we stand and we marvel at the inspired Word that the Holy Spirit gave us. And we look at these men and we look at the circumstances and we look at the stories and we marvel. But we need to gain what God intends for us to gain from it. We need to learn the lessons that will help us and will spur us on in today in this particular area of this bond of fellowship. These two who were so important to the Apostle Paul, well today we need to be important to one another as God's people. Now first of all, I want to consider the basis of our bond of fellowship. There are a number of things, and obviously we can't cover them all, but I want to look at a few. What's the basis of this bond of fellowship that we have? When we see these three men in Scripture here, we see this bond of fellowship they have. There are things that have brought that to pass. There's a foundation there for that. Well, what is that foundation? Well, let's consider just a few things. First of all, as Christians today, we are fellow recipients of the love of God. All people are blessed by the love of God. Whether they realize it, whether they choose to accept it or not, all people are blessed by the love of God. However, there is a difference between the blessings that fall upon those who are faithful members of the Lord's church and those who have refused God and are not following His ways. For instance, those who do not obey God, they still receive blessings of His love. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. He says, now, if you want to be God-like, if you want to be the child that is like the Father, he says you need to be doing these things. But consider what he puts on the end of that in verse 45. For he maketh the Son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So God says, if you want to be like me, you're going to have to care about all people. The love of God goes to all people. But when you look at sunshine and you look at rain, you consider physical blessings that God offers to all people. But then you go over to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 which tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this rises far above the physical blessings. Though the physical blessings are important, they're necessary, and we thank God for them. Where would we be without the spiritual? And he says God's love reaches out. You know, it would be an eternal tragedy and loss to having gained the physical blessings of God in this life and stopped at that point and failed to render submission to Him and receive the spiritual blessings that are derived in the heavenlies and that are found in Christ Jesus. That love that God sets forth, we as brethren are recipients of that. And it helps lay the foundation of that bond, that basis of the bond that we have. Another basis for this is we as Christians are fellow beneficiaries of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We all stand in the same position of looking and realizing what our Lord and Savior has done for us. In Colossians 1 and verse 14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We stand in that position and we realize that nothing else nor anyone else could ever be in the position of offering what the sacrifice of Jesus alone offers. In fact, when you think about the blood, the blood sacrifice, you could take the blood of every individual in this room. Let's go a little further. You could take the blood of everyone alive on the face of the earth today. A little further. You could take the blood of everyone who has ever lived or who ever will live on the face of the earth and you could take and shed all of that blood and it would not even forgive one sin. We are fellow beneficiaries of that sacrifice that was given. And so we have a common bond there because we have recognized and 
thanks be to God that we have recognized the blessing of forgiveness through that blood. And we enjoy the opportunity of that cleansing. At 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 teaches us that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. That continual cleansing, the present tense there. And so we have that common foundation there of that forgiveness as we look to God and as we obey Him. A third basis is that we are fellow members of the church of Christ, the body of Christ. Baptism puts one into Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 and 27, biblical baptism places one there. In verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So biblical baptism, for those of us who are Christians, has put us into Christ. We are there. We are added to the church by the Lord Himself. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we're told there, after the people on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of our Lord had the gospel preached unto them, we're told some 3,000 people obeyed. And in verse 47, we're told, so praising God and having favor with all people, the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. We are a part of a special body that God has added us to because we have submitted to baptism and we are members of His body. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit you are all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. It's a very special relationship needs to be treated that way. It's unfortunate and it's sad that in some places brethren do not see the urgency of recognizing this special relationship as the Bible teaches. And they treat it flippantly. And they neglect it and they abuse it. We need to be careful. In this life we have a blessed opportunity to be a member of that body. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, one place where God helps us to see the special nature of it, as ye therefore have opportunity. Now that's not to lay back and say, well, Lord, hit me in the head with that opportunity. It carries the idea of we need to be seeking out. As we look out to find opportunity, let us do good unto all men. What? Especially those of the household of faith. Now, that's the inspired Word of God saying, especially those of the household of faith, we have a special, marvelous relationship. And may we never forget that. And may we always look to God's Word to guide us in such a way that we will have that as a body of Christ. And of course, it only comes through following His Word. Let me ask you a question. Why would a person in this life have their best friends, their best acquaintances do all the things that they enjoy doing in life? Why would one want to do that with the people of the world? Why would, want, would one want to make their best friends, their closest acquaintances, why would they want to make that people of the world and then when the end comes they will spend eternity with the people of God? Something's just not right with that picture. Now, don't get me wrong. Just as we mentioned earlier, well, to love all people. There's nothing wrong with having friendships with those outside of Christ. Maybe we can, in fact, we should be using that to try to help them to come to Christ so that they can enjoy the relationship with us in Christ. It is special. But also, another basis is we are fellow soldiers in the service of our Lord. God didn't call us to sit and be bench warmers. He called us to be soldiers. And there's an army of God that needs to stand against the army of Satan. The book of Revelation teaches us the victory has been won. We need to grasp it. We need to take hold on it. As a Christian, we enlist in the Lord's army and we must stand for His cause no matter what. The old statement is, all it takes for evil to prosper is for good men to do nothing. We have such a marvelous relationship as fellow soldiers. 
And we need to stand beside one another. And we need to face that enemy. And we need to go forward. And we need to gain people for Christ. And we need to save souls away from that enemy who's seeking to take them down. What a comfort and encouragement to know that we do not fight this battle alone. Of course, obviously, number one, we have God on our side. But we have our brethren to stand with us, to stand beside us, to help prod us on. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, thou, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. Verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please the one who hath chosen him as a soldier. It's not enough just to enlist we have to follow our master. This is just, these are just a few of the basics that's, that help lay the foundation for the marvelous opportunity in this bond of fellowship that we have that Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus enjoyed. There are others, but I want to look at a few other things at this time. But, but we have that and other marvelous foundational facts that should strengthen us and we should build upon. Secondly, what are the benefits of this bond of fellowship? We have so many marvelous benefits. Of course, in our world, there are bonds in the world that inherently have restrictions. Others have self-imposed restrictions due to selfishness or other human traits. However, when you look at the bond that we have in Christ Jesus, those who follow Jesus, the benefits surmount those worldly boundaries. So many in the world, it's all about me. Everything's about me. With us, it's all about God. But we receive so many benefits as we look to Him. Christians, for, for instance, we enjoy the benefit of rejoicing and weeping together. In Romans 12 and verse 15, Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to weep alone? It's a hard thing to weep alone. Isn't it marvelous that when we rejoice, we have those who rejoice with us? God blesses us with one another in a very important way. Often in the world, such conditions as rejoicing and weeping are conditional, depending on how it may affect the parties that are involved. Again, you go back to this self-gain idea. Well, maybe I'll rejoice with you or maybe I'll weep with you. Well, but maybe it depends on the political correctness of the matter. I almost hate to say that terminology. Well, if it's politically correct, then I'll side with you on your rejoicing or I'll side with you on your weeping. How sad. I wish to the extent needed that not only our country but the world would get over this idea of political correctness and do what's right. Just do what is right. We as Christians need to do what is right. When we have a brother that's weeping, we need to weep with them and help them. If they're rejoicing, we need to rejoice with them and be thankful for the blessings of God. In the church, we have genuine concern for each other that transcends the barriers of this world that would otherwise present, uh, prevent such emotions and such help in time of need. But there's exhortation. We have the benefit of exhortation. When you look around us in the world, you find little of that unless it's to help me. Again, it goes back to the selfish nature. Now, not among all. There, there are people out there who are great exhorters. But Satan is trying to take it the other way. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. Exhortation is a marvelous benefit in being a child of God. Life is challenging to say the least. Exhortation and support is seriously important both here and to encourage us in the hereafter. In the world, one is so often beaten down. And exhortation can make an eternal difference if we as God's people will just simply enact it. I was preaching a sermon one time, and one of the points in that sermon 
was to encourage the brethren that, you know, it's not just the hereafter that we are to enjoy to the fullest extent, although that is going to be the greatest. But God intends for us to enjoy now. I came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly, our Lord said. And I tried to encourage the brethren that, you know, we need to be thankful for the life God has given us now. And we need to realize He intends for us to enjoy it in the extent that He blesses us to enjoy. And then there was a man from the audience that said, Amen. And you think, well, okay. But this was a different amen. This man had been crippled and paralyzed from a very young age in life. Never to walk again. Never to be able to run. Never to be able to, to, to do the things that others of us may sometimes take for granted. Here I am trying to exhort the brethren to make the most of life in an enjoyable way as God encourages us and blesses us to do, that we need to be encouraging one another. And his one amen encouraged me more than I felt like I had encouraged any of them. Here's a man that says, yes, we need to enjoy life to the fullest as our Lord blesses us to. And he was in that condition brother in Christ, exhorting me with one word in a sermon that may have gone further than several words that I had to say. Also, we enjoy the benefit of forgiveness among one another. Can you imagine a world without forgiveness? Can you imagine the church without forgiveness? Unfortunately, there are times that we see unforgiveness among members and it's a horrible thing. It's not just a sad thing. It's a horrible thing. We're told in Colossians 3 and verse 13, Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. We have the privilege of forgiveness. The world often never forgives. You do something against me, I'll never let you forget it, and I'm not going to forgive you. You find among the world, and unfortunately, the possibility among brethren, I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. That's not the fellowship God calls us into. God's people are a forgiving people. Where would we be if our God wasn't a forgiving God? We rise above petty, sinful thoughts that Satan would use to try to take such privileges away from us. Now, Christians aren't perfect. We're not sinlessly perfect. We make mistakes and we need forgiveness from God and we need it from one another. And so we seek that. We seek forgiveness from God. We seek forgiveness from one another. What a benefit we have in this bond of fellowship with our brethren and with God. But Christianity takes it further as God designs. God designs it in such a way that if we have been sinned against, we go to that party and we work with them so that we can forgive them. Because that's what brotherly love does in the church. That's what God's people do. Another benefit there is help in time of need. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5 tells us that we are to bear our own burdens. That's true. There are those things that we are to shoulder up and we are to take upon us and we are to do. But we're also told in verse 2 Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So there are those times and opportunities when maybe in an otherwise careless world, in the church, we have brethren to help take up that slack, to help carry that load. We live in what is often termed as a dog-eat-dog-eat dog world, where such actions as help in the time of need appear to be dwindling with each passing day. Among the worldly, help is given sometimes, but it's under the guise of, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Now if I'm going to help you, you realize that I'm going to call on you to help me. That's part of the deal. God's fellowship among His people. 
blesses us that we can help someone and be thankful for the privilege of it and do it with the understanding that they may never be able to do anything in return. They may never be able to do anything back, but that's not why we do it. We do it because we love God and His ways and their best and we love His people and we want to do what we need to do. Companionship, another benefit. Companionship is important. Companionship in the church is essential. Verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 3, exhort one another daily. All too often in our society, there's a stampede type mentality that rushes on in self-ambition and cares little for the casualties that lay beneath. Not with God's faithful people. In Christ, there's a genuine concern one for another that reaches out with love and encouragement in trials and temptations and tribulations and says, I I'm there to help. It allows our words and our intents and our actions to be in harmony as we look to Jesus as that perfect example. That's where it is. We're not trying to set a new standard. The standard has been set long ago in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we seek to live up to it as best we can. I want to sum up these benefits. There are many others we could look at, but, but, but love. There's a love among God's people that unfortunately the world doesn't know. And they won't find it anywhere else. May we help them to see it. One last point. What is to become of this bond of fellowship? We've looked at the basis of it, the foundation. We've looked at benefits. Now, what is to become of it? Now, give this a thought. When you examine other bonds of fellowship that uh, people uh, hold on to in this life, do you realize that every one of those will cease when this life is over? Everyone. It doesn't matter what it is. All others will cease when this life is over. It's only for here. It's only for now. It's not the case with we as Christians in the Lord's church. It transcends this life into eternity. I think about Luke 16 and verse 19 where Jesus spoke of the rich man and the beggar named Lazarus. They both died. Whatever uh, bond of fellowship that the rich man had in this life, he lost, and he went to a horrible place. Lazarus is noted as being in Abraham's bosom. Not only will it transcend this life, and all of us who are here today as we're faithful to God, when the time comes and we leave this world, we will be with the Lord in eternity following judgment, and we'll be together in a very special way there, but we'll be with all of God's people throughout all ages. And that bond of fellowship will continue on as we praise our God forever and ever. In John 5 and verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, which fellowship do you want? Do you want the fellowships that end when this life is over, whether it's through death or when the Lord comes again? Wouldn't you rather enjoy the blessed bond of fellowship that stands between such men as Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus and us? You see, when we consider these three men, the writings that Paul said about them, it should be encouragement to our bond of fellowship today in the church. May we continue to study God's holy word. And may situations and circumstances such as these spur us on so that we can be there in fellowship with our brethren as we should that we can stand always watchful to keep the enemy out, and if sin enters, that we can take care of it as God said, that things may change, forgiveness may be in order, and we may go forward in the Lord's work as we stand for Him and His ways in the greatest work, in the greatest bond of fellowship that this world has ever known. Thank you for the time.